everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I'm your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find all of my work by going to porkinspolicyreview.wordpress.com. Well, for today's episode, we are joined on the line by Eric Dreitzer, and Eric is one of my absolute favorite uh, political analysts and journalists. He runs the Stop Imperialism website and podcast. He is a frequent contributor to RT's Op Edge section, and he is also a frequent commentator on uh, Russia Today, Press TV, and Black Agenda Report. And today, we're going to be speaking with Eric about a recent article that he wrote called The Secret War in Libya, as well as the current situation in Libya. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Well, uh, there's uh, so much going on in the news right now. Uh, We've got the situation in Ukraine, which is sort of getting wall-to-wall coverage, uh, which is, of course, important, and it deserves that. But uh, what sort of uh, flew a little bit under the radar recently was the three-year anniversary since the NATO-led war in Libya. And before we get into your article and some of the really important things that you bring up in there, perhaps, Eric, you could uh, sort of set up the current situation in Libya right now for the listeners. And we've got, for all intents and purposes, a failed state, militias running around, uh, controlling everything. But perhaps you could uh, expand that a little bit for everybody. Sure. Well, I think that you kind of nailed it. And if we were to summarize it in one sentence, that it has become a failed state. It was not a failed state before the NATO-led war on Libya. It certainly is that now. And of course, the the term state is sort of outmoded when it comes to Libya at this point, because the state has utterly disintegrated. There is no true uh, state anymore. There is rather a patchwork of, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of different regions that are controlled by many different tribes and clans, and the uh, the militias that run the various regions are, to varying degrees, either aligned with or allied against the central government in Tripoli. So it is certainly a chaotic situation, to say the least. But um, I think that we could start with the most recent news of this week, I suppose, or I guess it was, yeah, earlier this week. Mm. Um, and that was the, uh, well, attempted the jailbreak that occurred where you had dozens of militants and criminals who were uh, escaped out of prison. But most specifically, the biggest news was the, um, the quota, and I'm air quoting here, the coup attempt that took place against the government by uh, General Hifter, who is known as the sort of nominal general in charge of the military, whatever that means in Libya these days. But of course, Hifter, we should note, is is a well-known and and highly infamous CIA operative going back many decades. I mean, he was based out of Virginia once he was kind of kicked out of the country by Gaddafi. He was used by the Reagan administration as uh, sort of a putschist. He was supposed (laughs) to lead an overthrow of the Gaddafi government in the uh, 1980s. This is somebody who has a long track record of nefarious activity with the CIA. Now, what happened this past week was a videotaped message that was released by Hifter and his associates where they essentially said that uh, that the military was taking it upon itself to lead the country in a new direction. Now, such an ambiguous statement would certainly lead to a variety of questions, but what is interesting about all of this is nothing happened. Absolutely nothing changed on the ground, and there was no substantive uh, demonstration of force from the military of any kind. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the military exists pr- pretty much in name only, that Hifter, whatever his motivation was or is, is certainly not commanding too much authority on the ground. And most specifically, the militias don't recognize the authority of any central government, nor do they recognize the authority of a centralized military force. So what you see, and I, I haven't even mentioned, of course, Prime Minister Zaidan, who is the <laughs> hand-picked neo-colonial puppet is what I would call him, prime minister of the country. And so the the picture that I'm trying to paint here is one of competing factions, but more importantly, overlapping competing factions that in many ways are attempting to play both sides and really three or four sides simultaneously. 
And I, I think to step back even further, more broadly, you see that the three basic regions of Libya, the three historic regions being Tripolitania, where you have the central capital of Tripoli in the west, in the east, you have the Cyrenaica region with Benghazi as its primary uh, uh, population center, and then the south, which is much more, you know, quote unquote, African, that is to say, where you have more of the dark skinned Libyan groups, the various groups. Of um, associated with the Tuareg people, such as the Tawerga tribe and others, the Fezan province more generally. These three regions are distinctly different from each other ethnically, they're distinctly different from each other economically, and they're distinctly different from each other politically. And not only are you seeing uh, conflict between the various regions, you're seeing many different conflicts breaking out within each region. And of course, I suppose we'll later get into who some of those forces are in the various regions and what their motivations are. But um, there's an excellent article that I would recommend uh, to listeners that I believe it came out earlier today on Counterpunch by the excellent journalist Ramzi Baroud, who goes into all, all of the specifics that I've just laid out with regard to Hifter, his history, with regard to some of these overlapping uh, uh, tendencies that you see among these various uh, groups. And so I would, I would say that in order to get an understanding of what's happening in Libya today, you not only need to label it as chaos, you need to somehow make sense of the chaos. Mm. And of course, this is completely ignored in the, the corporate media. I uh, forced myself in preparation for this to read some uh, an article in the New York Times, uh, you know, praising the NATO led war and, and saying that uh, now people have democracy, people can say whatever they want to. And, and, uh, and I also read a, an NPR article that was just pure propaganda where they they say that the the number of people killed from this war was a just a you know a minor number about 8000 people which is grossly inaccurate uh, and of course nowhere in here is the mention of al qaeda nowhere in here is mentioned the legality of the this this you know phony un resolution that went to war in libya and as you say we we've got this sort of chaos all throughout the country and uh you know, militias running around. We've got the the CIA controlled Muslim Brotherhood dominating the government. Uh, we I think there also uh, yesterday there were or a few days ago there were these mass protests against the government in Tripoli, Tripoli and Benghazi, who have extended their uh, mandate to rule. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and I would I would pose one point of clarification because I don't entirely. Uh, I, I don't want to mischaracterize it. Um, the government, that is to say the government of Zaidan, to whatever extent it can be called a government, is not purely a Muslim Brotherhood government. There are there are competing factions even within this government. The Muslim Brotherhood elements have a tr have some degree of popular support in Libya uh, on the sort of their political rivals or those who are aligned around Zaidan, who mm. in, in the parlance of Western uh, corporate media would be called the moderate or the liberals or the neoliberals, I think, is a much more accurate term for them. So, and, and it is these two competing forces within the government, the so-called assembly, the National Assembly, uh, they are the ones who are really kind of at odds with each other. And so when they're talking about the current protests that are taking place uh, against the government, it is, it is those groups who are behind the Muslim Brotherhood representatives who I, I think could be uh, somewhat understood to be a hybrid between the Muslim Brotherhood elements that you've seen in Tunisia and the Muslim Brotherhood elements who were deposed from government in Egypt. So uh, I think that that distinction is important. Uh, moreover, I would say that uh, more than we should uh, regard the Muslim Brotherhood as CIA controlled, I think that that's slightly uh, reductionist in my judgment, because really the key to understanding that is the Muslim Brotherhood's connection to Qatar. Now, more broadly, we can go back historically over multiple decades and talk about U.S. and, and British intelligence and their establishment of the Muslim Brotherhood, and all of that's absolutely accurate. But for purposes of analysis on the ground right now, it is 
Qatar who are bankrolling the Muslim Brotherhood factions in all of these countries as a means of spreading their influence throughout uh, North Africa generally. So uh, I think that that clarification is important. Not that I'm disagreeing with your characterization. Oh, no, no, no. And and I know that you have been very uh, diligent about pointing out Qatar in, um, in, in all of these sort of uh, North African conflicts. It's yeah. one of the reasons I'm blacklisted from Al Jazeera, my friend. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, and, and Al Jazeera has certainly taken the mantle of, uh, you know, one of the biggest pushers of propaganda in terms of Libya or Mali or any of these countries where Qatar is, is actually quite invested exactly. uh, in, in building up uh, – the Brotherhood and mosques uh, and, and aid groups and all those uh, sort of things, but perhaps now we could we could um, shift it and and sort of try and break this apart and and get a little bit more in detail. And uh, as I said in the beginning, you wrote a really excellent article called "The Secret War in Libya," and um, perhaps we could we could dive into that and we can start, I guess, uh, broadly with uh, your reporting that on January 18th we had these green resistance fighters expelling uh, government forces, um, and again in quotations, whatever these. these <laughs> forces really are uh, from a base in Sabha and um, perhaps you, you could uh, explain that to the listeners a little bit Sure. Well, let me first define who are some of these actors when we, because I, I don't know to what extent um, people have been following this or, or, or know the history of it. When we say green resistance, and when I talk about green resistance, these are the fighters who represent the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya, uh, the government of Gaddafi. Um, Western media likes to call them Gaddafi loyalists, though I think that, that even that is somewhat mm -hmm. of a misnomer because many of them, it's, it's not even necessarily about allegiance to Gaddafi as it is a an ardent and fervent nationalism that they feel that uh, that their country was stolen from them by a uh, foreign imperial army. Um, so I think that the green resistance is something that needs to be understood. Green was the, the color of, of the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya, the government of Gaddafi, the revolution as it was known. Uh, the, the, the flag of, of uh, free Libya was, was a purely green flag. And so green represents what Libya was before the NATO uh, war on the country. And so when we define the green resistance, we have to understand that this is a complicated mixture of a number of different groups, many of whom aren't necessarily, uh, you know, um, natural allies, but who have kind of come together in some form under this broad umbrella of the green resistance. And so, you know, we have to have something to call it. So that's that's really the term to describe. But um, they are comprised of, of, as I said, various groups. On the one hand, you have uh, ethnic Arabs who are uh, very much, you know, pro Gaddafi, who were, you know, uh, in de fighting in defense of Libya, the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya, as it was known. And you also have dark skinned African black Libyans and uh, uh, from other countries as well, who also fought on the side of Gaddafi for a number of reasons that we can go into as well, particularly with regard to the, uh, the black Libyan population. They're generally concentrated in the south, in the Fizan province, around some of the uh, population centers in that region. And they also, to a large extent, are part of this green resistance. Now, it's unclear, simply because the information is not fully uh, uh, available to us, it's unclear to what extent they're, uh, they're the same force or to what extent their agendas of resistance have kind of coincided with each other, or to what extent that they're actually, you know, coalescing into a new whole. This is still unclear, but I think that that's somewhat of a secondary issue. Primarily, we should be focused on differentiating between the green resistance on the one hand, who are certainly anti-government, that is to say anti-neo-colonial puppet government, but they are also against the Islamist militias. Many of these militias, these are not exactly uh, tolerant individuals and tolerant groups. They are extremists to a large extent. They are Islamists, not exclusively, but many of them are. And they are very much regional. Okay, so you have Islamist militias from Zintan. They are the ones who are still holding Saif Gaddafi against uh, international law. You have uh, Islamist militias from the West, from the East. You have Islamist militias in the South as well. They are also 
anti-central government, but they're anti the green fighters as well. So, uh, you know, it's it's a complicated uh, issue, and Libya always was a complicated issue. Uh, Libya was only a united nation for one period in its history, and that was under Gaddafi and the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. It was a nationalist project, and that nationalist project was destroyed, and that is why you have all of this chaos. Now, coming back to the initial question, though, about the taking of this of this air base, this happened now, you know, a little over a month ago. And what you saw was a push by uh, some combination of the two pa- the two parts of the green resistance who then took over this air base in Sabah, one of the major uh, centers in the southern portion of Libya. I mean, it's not all the way south, of course, because there's vast swaths of desert, but what we would call the southern portion of Libya. And the taking of this air base was very significant because this was the first time since the, the really the, the quote-unquote end of the war in Libya that you saw a significant strategic push by the resistance fighters. And this was actively suppressed in Western media. I would imagine that uh, unless people read my article and maybe one or two other independent sites out there, they most likely didn't even hear about it. The only mention in Western media that I found anywhere was a direct quote from Prime Minister Zaidan himself who acknowledged that it was green resistance fighters who took over that air base, but he said that they would be dispatched in a matter of hours. Now, it's unclear exactly how this was all resolved from from indications on the ground. The base was taken and then retaken by uh, government forces who, of course, have overwhelming firepower provided to them by NATO and the Western powers. Um, but it, I don't think it really detracts from the significance of this event. It marks a turning point in the post-war Libyan period because it is at this moment that we can say without question that the so-called government of Libya does not control Libya, that the militias are not uh, all-powerful and omnipotent on the ground, that there is this third force in the country, and it is a force who recognizes the historical responsibility that they have to restore the nation of Libya. Mm. And and just to reinforce this uh, notion that the government is really just so mismanaged, I mean, we've got Prime Minister Zaydan uh, was abducted, I think, a year ago and was held for a number of days by a, a various militia. As you mentioned before, we've got the militia in... Uh, if I could just add, just for a little comedy's sake, so that people understand <laughs> just how chaotic it is, Zaidan was kidnapped by a militia and then freed hours later by another militia. <laughs> okay? So that, I think, illustrates what what's going on in Libya. Oh, yeah. No, it, 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 it's so funny when you read Western media and they talk about how insane Gaddafi was and this, you know, the, the cult of personality and his female bodyguards. And, it, you know, it's portrayed as such a wacky state, um, sort of on the lines of, of, say, North Korea. But then when you look at the reality of Libya right now, as you say, we've got militias kidnapping the prime minister, uh, holding up uh, oil production, doing all of these various different things. It really is insane to live there but perhaps we can um we can explore a little bit about this sort of reorganization or this third force that you're talking about and particularly the the black libyans who uh, for all intents and purposes have been the most ignored factor uh both in this this post-war period but also during the war and uh, we maybe we can we can explore a little bit about you know why the the as you say, the uh, Tuarega, the Tobu, many of these different ethnic minorities are sort of realigning themselves or at least seeing that they have a common enemy with the Green Resistance. And maybe you, you, you could tell the listeners a little bit about uh, why this would be in terms of the, the violence that they saw during the 2011 war. Absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, I think it should be pointed out. And again, I, I don't know to what extent the audience is... Um, Uh, aware of many of these points, but Gaddafi was universally recognized by the United Nations, by every independent organization in the years leading up to the war that destroyed his country, the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. 
He was recognized universally as being a protector of the human rights of black Libyans yes. and of, generally of the uh, African peoples of North Africa more broadly. He extended political rights and economic rights to uh, migrant workers from Chad, from Niger, from Mauritania, from Mali, and from many other countries in the region. In fact, he made it an, uh, an absolute mission of his country and himself personally to spread economic development throughout all of Africa. He was a champion of the notion of uh, United States of Africa, the notion that Africa could develop itself outside of the purview of the IMF and the World Bank and the United States and Europe and the rest of the colonial powers, that Africa didn't need them, that Africa could be self-sufficient and could develop on its own and in its own way. And it is for that reason alone, among many other reasons, that Gaddafi was beloved not only by the uh, the, the black um, uh, peoples of North Africa, but more generally by the leaders of Africa. It, look at how long it took. Uh, many of these weak and feckless leaders in Africa to bow down and to, uh, and to dis uh, um, distance themselves from Gaddafi. They provided whatever meager resistance they could diplomatically. It shows you the extent to which Gaddafi was revered by these people. Um, moreover, if you look at the, uh, the economic development of Libya under Gaddafi, it is staggering. Libya was number 47 in the UN Human Development Index. It was ahead of so-called developed countries like Brazil and Russia and many other countries which had centuries of development. Um, well, that's false, but decades of development uh, ahead of Libya. And yet Libya was able to climb up that, that, uh, that list. Why? Because of things like universal education, universal health care, water projects, road development, railroad development, uh, education for all, higher education for anyone who was willing and able to go that route. I point all of this out so that people have an understanding of the lies that have been told about Gaddafi. I mean, outright lies and distortions that have been told about Gaddafi. Why was it that Gaddafi had to be destroyed? Because he he presented an alternative. He presented something outside of the imperial, colonial, whatever you want to call it, structure. Okay, and it is, and coming back to this question of the, the, the black Libyans, this is part of the reason why they loved Gaddafi and why they laid their lives down for him, because Gaddafi represented progress for them. He represented integration into a nation that otherwise would have absolutely abandoned them. Uh, and this is part of the reason why during this war you saw this unbelievable genocidal activity that happened in the southern part of the country, uh, primarily the so-called rebels of the um, the uh, Al-Qaeda variety, of course, the Libyan Islamic fighting group led by Abdel Hakim Belhaj, uh, many of the other organizations, some of which were indigenous, some of which were imported into the country by the CIA, why these organizations, these terrorists, were engaged in wholesale ethnic cleansing. Because A, of course, they're just outright racist. I mean, that's <laughs> an obvious point. But most specifically because they understood that Gaddafi represented hope for these people and that anybody who would be going after Gaddafi would make an enemy of black Libyans and that's exactly what happened and so when you look at what happened to the Tawerga people mass displacement if you look at what happened throughout the Fezzan province you have genocidal ethnic cleansing carried out lynches rapes mm -hmm. murders on a, on a wholesale uh, scale all of this happened and all of it was suppressed by the Western media and when I say media I don't just mean the news. I mean the so-called NGOs like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, who, to their credit, did later document a little bit of what happened. But in the moment when it was happening, when something could have been done, when the world could have been told of what was really going on to the black population, they were silent. Matter of fact, they weren't just silent. They were actively cheerleading the war. They were acting as uh, I suppose you could call them the left flank of the propaganda machine against Libya. And uh, so 
you know, I, I suppose I would just close this thought with with the fact that all of these peoples, what they went through leading up to the war, during the war, and after the war, the destruction of the hope that they had, this is what has led many of them into the resistance. This is what has led many of them to completely dissociate themselves from both the Islamist militias and the so-called central government. And this is why you see groups like you mentioned, the Tubu ethnic group, who are sticking very close together. They are they are essentially adhering to very strict clan and tribal lines and delineations for the purposes of collective self uh, preservation and security and nothing else. Mm. And I, I, and it's very important to note this this total blackout that was going on. Um, I mean, it was just even in the alternative, uh, the so-called alternative media completely covered this up. And uh, any of the listeners that are interested, Cynthia McKinney has a really excellent book, yes. and she was actually in Libya and documented a lot of this and. There are various other contributors who wrote articles on this, uh, and it, it really is important to. Uh, th- th- I just I find it so fun. You know, it's it's sort of in the background. You kind of hear little things, but you you know people don't really see the big picture. And of course, uh, it was just ridiculous. These, uh, call, you know claims that Gaddafi was importing in African mercenaries from all these countries. And and there might be some truth to that, but people don't understand that there is a a very large black population in Libya. So they also don't understand if I could just, I'm sorry. hmm. Oh no, no, please. They also don't understand that, that Gaddafi didn't simply see himself as the leader of Libya. Gaddafi saw himself as spreading uh, economic development and rights to people throughout North Africa. This is why the Tuaregs of Mali were deeply devoted to Gaddafi. It wasn't just because he was paying them. Certainly, he was paying like every other leader in the world pays a military force and pays the various organizations that provide security and fight on their behalf. I mean, is there, you know, it, it's funny when you hear this notion of quote unquote African mercenaries, because I, I just want to point out that there is an inherent racism in mm-hmm. the way in which that is portrayed, because the idea that they want to plant in the public consciousness when they say, quote, African mercenaries is what they mean when they, you know, they, they want you to think of Sierra Leone or, you know, child yes. soldiers or, you know, genocides in mm. Rwanda or whatever, you know, because they understand that most Americans, most Westerners wouldn't be able to distinguish one African country from another. The Tuareg people especially, but not exclusively, were very devoted to Gaddafi because, like I said already, Gaddafi was hope, Gaddafi was protection, and Gaddafi was development. He was the future for them. And if you look at the the the, the um, support that Gaddafi provided, not only to the Tuareg people from Mali and from Chad and Niger, but also to a country like Eritrea, which is which was suffering mm. tremendously and continues to suffer tremendously under brutal sanctions imposed by the United Nations uh, at the will of the United States. If you look at what Gaddafi was able to do with all of these countries, you understand why they have to uh, so heavily distort Gaddafi's relationship relationship to them. Yeah, and and I think that that's really the main crux or reason for this uh, imperial war is of course not because Gaddafi uh, abused human rights and uh, and you know even even so even even the the heinous things that that he uh, did or, or you know did or didn't do uh, it's still it, what this is really about is an independent leader in a uh, continent that the West sees uh, as, as sort of their playground that they can carve up and that they can, uh, you know, exploit. And and this is really the, the main thing. And, and we've spoken about this before um, with uh, Gaddafi's pan-African currency that he wanted yes. to create, uh, one that would be completely separate from the IMF and France and the West. It would be a currency backed by gold. And, of course, we, we have uh, the uh, president in the Ivory Coast was uh, very interested in this. And then, of course, we got rid of him. And I think that would, would uh, also be the sort of beginning of this uh, new colonization of Africa, starting with the Ivory Coast and then moving along to all of, you know, Mali, the Central African Republic, Mozambique, as we've spoken about before. But this is really what it's all about, uh, is about destroying uh, an independent leader that didn't really want to play ball. Um, <laughs> but that's right. And let me just add, Gaddafi did play ball on certain things. You know, Gaddafi yes. was cajoled into giving up his weapons program, which... Mm. 
you know, if you look at it in hindsight, was a tremendous mistake uh, because it might have, you know, it might have saved him and might have saved the country. But um, Gaddafi played ball on on certain things, rendition, other things, yes. because he understood very clearly, very early on after 9-11, what would happen if you didn't at least somewhat play ball with the United States, that you would be you would go the way of Saddam Hussein. And sadly, Gaddafi did go the way of Saddam Hussein. But Gaddafi and Saddam were completely different different kinds of leaders. Um, and I think that that's important to note. And just to add kind of a little bit to your point, you mentioned the pretext of human rights for this war, which mm. certainly we heard from, you know, uh, imperialists like Samantha Power and Susan oh, Rice God, and yes. Clinton. You know, they talked a lot about human rights, but they had nothing to say on the issue 10 months earlier when Gaddafi was praised at the United Nations for protecting human rights, mm. when he was specifically singled out among all leaders in Africa and really throughout the world as being the one who was doing perhaps the most for promoting human rights, particularly in Africa, particularly at a time when you have raging conflicts and genocide going on in the Congo, when you have a horrific uh, war-torn country like Somalia and all throughout the continent, you had Gaddafi who was talking about human rights, universal education, universal health care, clean water, uh, you know, uh, uh, agricultural land given to families willing to work the land and so forth. So all of this, I think, really serves to paint this picture for listeners that Gaddafi is not what they said he was, that Gaddafi was a true independent leader, more, you know, kind of to your point, independent to Gaddafi didn't simply mean that he controlled his country and no one else told him what to do. Independence meant that you were not going to be beholden to neoliberal finance capital, that Wall Street would not own you through debt, that Wall Street would not own you through loans, through anything, that you would be truly independent. And let me just point out one more thing. Name me other countries where you had true profit sharing from the oil revenue. Mm -hmm. There are very very few, if any, examples that you could point to. And yet in Libya, each family received a check every month that was a, uh, a piece of the oil pie. All of that. And of course, the great man-made river project, which was one of the first infrastructure projects that NATO attacked, which would have brought water not only to southern Libya, but throughout all of North Africa, allowing it to develop agriculturally and allowing to move forward into the 21st century. All of that destroyed. All of that was the legacy of Gaddafi. They wanted to erase the man and erase his legacy, and they're doing a damn good job of it. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, there was just the other day some I think it was in the Daily Mail talking about, uh, you know, is, he's a sex fiend and this and that. And, uh, you know, while, you know, it, and even if it is true, it doesn't really take away from that doesn't mean that you have to completely dismiss everything else that he did. And, and, you know, I mean, as we're talking about, Libya was the richest, most prosperous nation in all of Africa. And, and this is including the so-called powerhouses like South Africa and, and sure. some of these other countries as well. And, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it is just completely startling, this sort of whitewashing. And also just to, to further, uh, you know, kind of put the nail, uh, a nail on the head on this. I mean, we're talking about going in brutally butchering tens of thousands of people, if not more, and then uh, dra dragging Gaddafi out of a sewer pipe, sodomizing him on camera, and then beating him to death. So the idea yeah. that that's uh, some, you know, uh, like Hillary Clinton, we came, we saw, he died, you know, that that's a psychopath right there. That is that is not a normal thing that you would say. And Absolutely. to sort of hold up uh, that action as equating that with democracy and human rights is so perverse in my mind. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, the, the insane laughter that she that she oh. had after the statement is is troubling, to say the least. But, you know, uh, I, I would also I would also say that um, Gaddafi Gaddafi was someone who certainly I mean, what you know, you, you can hear all kinds of stories about Gaddafi. I'm sure that some of them are true. Some of them are false. Some of them are exaggerations. But who cares? That's mm. not the point. Where World politics, geopolitics is not about good and bad, yes. whether you like someone or you don't like someone. It's about what they do, what they do on the world stage, what they do for their people. What they do behind closed doors is irrelevant. That's for the tabloids. That's for the Fox News and MSNBCs of the world. And anybody 
who's listening to that filth, as my uh, as my friend Keith Harmon Snow eloquently <laughs> states, anyone who follows that is contributing to their own mental illness. That's that's Keith Harmon Snow, who, by the way, one of excellent. the most experts excellent. on Africa. Yeah. Everyone should follow. Mm. Well, um, Eric, what, just to um, kind of put all this in context a little bit, if if we do see some sort of uh, move between the Black Libyans and the Green Resistance, and you talk about the idea that they could, if they formed an alliance, they could create some sort of de facto state in the South. Now, what would that really mean? Would this be, uh, I mean, sort of part of NATO's plan? Because we see that the, the fracturing of Libya into these various entities is sort is already going on. And I, I think uh, Srinaika was the first one to do this and that, you know, they, they've got their own prime minister, they print their own money uh, and no one really seems to be too bummed out about that. So what would the, the creation of a de facto Southern state really mean? Well, uh, I think you're quite right in pointing out that it is certainly part of the grander agenda of the uh, the, the ruling establishment, the uh, the imperialists, whatever you want to call them, uh, to break apart countries, to break them into smaller, more manageable uh, states that really not only could they not stand up to the United States, but they probably couldn't stand up to a large oil company. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that's certainly on the on the table and something that they're very much interested in. However, what I was pointing out was something a little bit uh, a little bit different, um, and that is that a confluence of interests between the Arab faction of the Green Resistance and the uh, the Black Libyans who are maybe associated with it. Uh, well, let me just say also, I don't mean to draw a clear distinction between those two because it's not entirely clear to what extent they are even different. They might already have come together in some kind of a way. Um, it's it's not entirely known, as as of course we all understand. This is an underground resistance movement. Mm. Uh, the you know there's not a ton of evidence and 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 incontrovertible facts that we can point to. So some of this we have to kind of speculate based on what we do know. And this incident in uh, on January 18th in Saba is a good indicator of some of the trends that we might be seeing. That was kind of the main thrust of my final mm -hmm. point that you're mentioning. Uh, now, in terms of a de facto state in the South, I don't know exactly what that would look like. It would most likely look not a lot different than what you already see in the <laughs> The sense of uh, you know the, the the tribal groups and the clans holding on dearly to their territories and uh, not certainly not willing to give up their guns, but but and this is this is the part that I would stress. We could see unification among some of these competing clans and competing tribes who understand the need for collective self-defense. Because what will happen eventually, I don't know how long it'll take, but eventually the, uh, the, the northern part of the country, the NATO-backed government, as well as the Islamists who in their own, you know, perverse and twisted way or also NATO back though perhaps we could say in a more indirect kind mm. of way um, eventually power is going to be consolidated in some fashion and when that happens they're coming for the south and they're coming in a way that uh, we haven't seen since the war ended and certainly the people in the south know that so um, I think that when I'm talking about a de facto state, what I'm really talking about is some kind of a collective self-defense alliance, one in which the clans and the tribes and the various groups, they'll still hold on to their territory, but they'll, able to, they'll be able to fight together. They'll be able to fend off these forces. Now, whether they'll ultimately be successful or not, certainly that still remains to be seen. And uh, briefly, Eric, just to put this in the bigger picture in terms of this uh, neo-colonialization, and, and I don't even uh, particularly like to use that term because it seems as if this is new, and I, I, this, is not, this is not new. They've never really yeah. stopped colonizing Africa. This is just uh, – um, it's become a little bit more in your face lately. But wh how do you see Libya fitting into this sort of imperial agenda uh, overall? Because a lot of people kind of uh, very quickly jump to the conclusion, oh, this is about oil, of course, you know. And while I do see that um, in countries like Mali, uh, like uh, Central African Republic, and certainly in Mozambique with all of this uh, natural gas that we have, that uh, we see uh, developing there, I do think that is a... a it's more clear cut, but with Libya, I'm not really so uh, 
positive that it is about oil because we see that oil production is, you know, virtually uh, non-existent, uh, at least uh, in, in the past couple of years. So, so is this really more about just the, the sort of method of destabilization, completely fracture up the country uh, so that it just won't really ever get off its, its feet again? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to that question, and so let me kind of try to go point by point. Number one, oil is certainly part of it. Um, it's it's grossly oversimplifying it to say mm. that it's all about oil. It is not all about oil, not by a long shot. Oil is a part of it. Oil is really kind of irrelevant. Libyan oil, I mean, is really irrelevant for the most part to the United States. Where it mattered was in Europe, and in mm. particular to the so- southern part of Europe, yeah. which is why you saw uh, France and and especially Italy kind of really quickly on board with all of this. One of the major players in Libya today. I know that there's problems getting the oil out, but one of the first companies that was very heavily uh, uh, lobbying to get its tentacles into Libya's oil industry was any ENI, the, the major Italian oil company. So uh, oil was definitely part of it, but you're absolutely right. Oil is a small piece of the much larger uh, puzzle. Number one, and, and this is, I think, what I, what I think that listeners should keep kind of at the forefront of their thinking is that Libya became and is currently and will continue to be be a base for the destabilization of the rest of North Africa. Mm. You saw a, a direct result of the war in Libya was a war in Mali, which then precipitated the need for the French to then uh, put boots on the ground and to reassert their colonial authority in Mali. And of course, they 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 cast this this false narrative as if oh well we who could have known that the fall of Libya would have led to a destabilization <laughs> of Mali as if we as if we had any idea that the Tuaregs in Libya would come back with guns mm. to continue their fight in Mali. Remember, the Tuareg people, who are um, kind of more or less a branch of the of the Berbers, as mm. you know, as, as understood historically, uh, the Tuareg people have been fighting a decades long war of their own independence in Mali to establish their own independent state of Azawad. Mm. And so, when the war in Libya ended, all of these armed fighters came back over to Mali and naturally, as you would imagine, picked up their own war of independence. Okay, so what happened was a direct result of the Libyan war was a war in Mali. A direct result of the war that begun in Mali was the infiltration of what's known as Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM, this very shadowy terror organization led by an equally shadowy (laughs) individual named Belmokhtar, who I I suppose we probably don't have time to get into him and and his shady dealings and connections to the Saudis and elsewhere. But uh, so the Tuaregs leaving Libya, fighting in Mali, leads to AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, infiltrating into that country using their um, uh, sort of what you could call uh, Wahhabist networks to then uh, it precipitate a war, which does what? It then leads directly to a coup, an overthrow of the government in Mali by mm-hmm. a guy named Captain Amadou Sanogo. And who is Captain Sanogo? He is trained by the United States. He is an appendage of AFRICOM. He was trained militarily in the United States. So one thing leads to another, leads to another. And then what happens with the destabilization of Mali is that that then spreads throughout the rest of the Sahel region. Of course, I think the most um, clear example uh, related to AQIM is the, uh, the, the heinous terrorist attack on the gas facility in Algeria which killed well I still I, I don't know if they still even know how many yeah. people were killed there so you see then that Libya was kind of an opening salvo for a much larger destabilization of the Sahel region now if you want to ask yourself why why would the United States want that could they possibly have foreseen that all you need to do is look at the Bush administration pre uh, AFRICOM when they established what was called the Trans-Sahel Initiative. 
okay? And the Trans-Sahel Initiative was a military initiative to embed U.S. military throughout the, what's known as the Sahel region or North Africa more, more broadly. So all of these things are connected. This is not conspiracy. These are simple facts that could be, that could be uh, gleaned from even a basic analysis of, of how these things all developed. So, yes, oil's a part of it, but the destabilization is the larger piece that you need to add to this equation because what does a destabilization provide? It provides a window for military occupation. Now, when I say occupation, I, of course, don't mean an occupation like we have in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. By occupation, I mean taking U.S. military operatives and embedding them in the governments and militaries of these various uh, uh, nations, as you saw in Mali, as you see in Niger. Uh, the United States has announced that they're building a secret, dr- uh, well, not secret, <laughs> but a drone base in Niger, the largest drone base in all of Africa. Now, would that have been possible if Gaddafi was still in Libya? I think not. So uh, the destabilization piece is a big one. Uh, and then, of course, as I've, I guess I've already alluded to it, the destruction of independent economic development, because it wasn't just Libya. Gaddafi was funding economic development all over the continent. If you look at Eritrea, if you look at mm. Zimbabwe, if you look at Angola, if you look at Zambia, many of these countries were very much uh, uh, aligned with Gaddafi and Gaddafi's vision, and so destroy Gaddafi, destroy Libya, destroy Africa, and by destroying Africa, you keep it enslaved. And slavery is really the key here, because of course, uh, those of us in the United States should understand very well what slavery really means. Slavery is not just a racial attitude. Mm. Slavery is an imperialist concept. Slavery is an economic system, and it is the economic system of finance capital that needs to see Africa continue to be enslaved. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, you really just uh, broke it down there and, and really just, you know, that that is the reality of this. This isn't about spreading democracy. Uh, you know, it never is. Well, well Eric, um, I've been talking for a little while now, so I guess we should we should start wrapping this up. Uh, do you have any final thoughts at all on on Libya, on Africa, anything that you want the listeners to uh, take away? Well, I mean, if you have any other questions, fire them. Please feel free. I uh, I'm I'm fired up. Let's, let's go. <laughs> well, I do wonder how how this really is going to turn out because it 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 just seems a Africa is so huge. You know, there are so many disparate sort of factions and groups and things going on. And, and AFRICOM seems to now be just about everywhere. Um, it, it, you know, how do you how do you see the role of AFRICOM in the next few years? I mean, it, it, obviously, they're, they're building up. But do you see, um, for instance, is, is Zimbabwe going to be next? I mean, that seems to be one of the few uh, independent leaders, however you feel about Robert Mugabe and his policies. He is an independent independent leader, uh, ostensibly, um, and, uh, you know, in the same same vein as Gaddafi, do you see uh, Zimbabwe? I mean, uh, countries like that, Eritrea, I mean, that's another one that the U.S. has been, uh, ju- I mean, completely destroying for decades now. Uh, how do you see, within the next couple of years, um, the role of AFRICOM and uh, the role of getting rid of these independent leaders? That's a great question. I think that it's it's absolutely critical to understand the role of AFRICOM. First of all, AFRICOM, which was established by the Bush administration in 2007, this was at least it was sold within the policy circles as just a, a simple reorganization. It was taking the disparate uh, uh, commands that existed that controlled Africa. So the United States had a sort of a command for West Africa, and that was based in Europe. They had their central command, uh, which controlled uh, the uh, sort of the eastern part of North Africa. They had another command, which controlled a different part of North Africa. So uh, AFRICOM was to kind of centralize all of this. And that 
that was how it was sold, that this was just a reorganization of what already existed. But this is, of course, a lie. We understand that AFRICOM is the establishment of a U.S. military presence, a cohesive U.S. military presence with a cohesive policy on the continent. Now, taken from the broadest perspective, AFRICOM's uh, uh, job in Africa, I mean, there's I suppose we should say there's many different responsibilities that they have, but one of the primary ones is to do everything they can to check the rise of China on the continent. Mm. China being a major, major player now in Africa. Uh, most recent numbers, I believe, that exist are for 2011, and they show that China, uh, depending on you know where you're where you're getting your numbers, is right behind the United States in terms of total investment in Africa. Now that's enormous when you consider how many uh, U.S. corporations are involved in mining operations all over the continent. When you consider how many U.S. Telecom companies are involved all over Africa. Just the sheer vastness of the U.S. corporate structure tells you that if China is catching up, that it's within one to two billion in terms of yearly uh, foreign direct investment, that China is heavily investing in Africa. And most importantly, what China provides is unconditional aid, that is to say investment. So hmm. where China goes, where China invests in building, uh, say, a factory or whatever, they also build the infrastructure to support it. They build the roads, they build the railroads, they build whatever needs to be built in order to have their investments be successful. Now, when those investments have run their course, the Chinese leave. But what do they leave behind? The infrastructure hmm. stays. No conditions upon this. There, China provides only China provides aid, and what we should define what we mean aid. It's not aid as the United States understands it. These are not giveaways to corrupt leaders who just put it in their pockets. <laughs> aid is comes in the form of investment. Okay, direct investment for which China profits. There's no doubt. I mean, that's why they're doing it. But the aid comes in the form of investment, and by doing that, China presents a very real alternative to many of these countries. A no conditions alternative. There's only one condition, and that is the recognition of the what's called the one China policy. In other words, we don't get involved in your business. You don't get involved in our business, and this will all work out just fine. Okay, that's the. I mean, that's the basic premise for, for, for Chinese investment in Africa. So wherever Africa, uh, excuse me, wherever China gets involved in Africa, you're sure to find AFRICOM equally involved in whatever form they, they, they can. And it, it's very important that people understand when we say AFRICOM is involved militarily, I, again, I don't mean that there's tanks rolling through the cities, uh, you know, the major capitals <laughs> throughout Africa. I mean that very, very well-trained and well-placed advisors, quote-unquote advisors, military advisors from the United States, embed themselves in the bureaucracy and the military hierarchies of of these various countries and by doing that they're able to control them because of course where a you know a high level you know captain or a colonel might be working with a local government this man is see is the representative of Washington he is the representative of the United States so what he says goes okay mm -hmm. so when we think about AFRICOM it is a matter of arm twisting it is a matter of influence it is a matter of command and control not in the direct sense Sense that we might be accustomed to, but in an indirect sense. And then, of course, when they talk about training, well, what does training mean? Are they just benevolently teaching, like, you know, in a classroom? No. <laughs> training means providing material support, arms, equipment, communications, advanced. Uh, technological communications and so forth, all of that is in this broad umbrella of training and advisory, you know, an advisory capacity. So AFRICOM's responsibility is to spread U.S. influence and to consequently check Chinese uh, growing influence. Now, I think a very clear example that we can point to would be Sudan. Absolutely. Sudan Leading up to uh, the 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 uh, division, the carving up of Sudan into two separate countries, Sudan had, uh, I believe, it is seventy eight percent of its total exports going to China. 
China alone accounted for more than three quarters of Sudan's total exports. Now, of course, the reason for that is because they're the, one of the primary exports being oil. Now, gee, where is the oil located in South Sudan? <laughs> or in Sudan, it is in the south. Okay, so you see a push by the United States under the auspices of human rights and humanitarianism and genocide in Darfur and mm. all of these other ideas to carve up Sudan, to carve it into two and to create the so-called Republic of South Sudan, which is nothing but a puppet state which is created by the U.S. and Israel, very deeply tied to Israel. Israel cannot go ignored in this equation. And South Sudan is run by... Well, now that they have a power struggle there, but generally it's run by war criminals. <laughs> it's run by Salva Kiir, who was the leader of the Sudanese, so-called Sudanese Libera People's Liberation Army, okay, the SPLA, right, which was long since funded by uh, the United States' two principal proxies and clients in the region, uh, Uganda and Rwanda, specifically President Museveni in Uganda and his little wingman, uh, Paul Kagame in Rwanda. Okay, so South Sudan is a creation of the United States for the purposes of blocking China. Think about this. China, the massive country that it is, the incredible industrial power that it is, China uh, uh, imported fully 8% of its total oil imports just from Sudan leading up to that point. That is a huge number, 8%, when you consider how much China imports from all over the world. That is an insanely large number. And to immediately deprive them of that key strategic resource, you can see very clearly what AFRICOM does. But certainly it's, it's, it's not alone. Zimbabwe, as you mentioned, is very much, uh, it's been high on the, uh, on the Western imperial hit list now for going on two decades. There's a number of reasons why uh, I, would, I would point people to a series of articles that I did on that. They can, they can go to my website, they can find them on Counterpunch and elsewhere, uh, where I talked about why President Mugabe and the ZANU-PF are so reviled by the West. It is because they also represent uh, independence from the imperial system. They had an indigen they have an indigenization process going on in that country, which means no foreign corporation, with the exception of a couple of key Chinese ones, no foreign corporation is able to own more than 49% of anything in the country, of any natural resource. Why? Because they understand that to give majority stake to Western corporations means to lose your sovereignty completely. Okay, and that is one of the principal reasons, of course, the main reason that uh, Mugabe became a villain was the, um, the, uh, the, the land redistribution program, taking away the land from the, from the wealthy white landowners, the vestiges of the Rhodesian colony, the colonial ruling class, taking it away from them and giving it to the indigenous African people. Okay, so there's a number of reasons for this, and you can see why Zimbabwe is so closely aligned with China, because they understand that to move away from China is to invite their own destruction. Uh, anybody who wants to know more about that, you could check out my articles. The MDC, the Movement for Democratic Change, so-called opposition in Zimbabwe, is a U.S. puppet uh, political party established by the U.S. and the U.K. I could rattle off thousands <laughs> of examples all over Africa that show this same point. Um, the, the, the basic point, and I, I, you know, I'll end it here, is that AFRICOM represents an imperial military presence for the purposes of maintaining and extending Western hegemony in Africa. And this is principally what I and anybody else who calls themselves an anti-imperialist has to fight against. Absolutely. Absolutely. A very, very sage advice to anybody out there who is interested in this. And I mean, as you said, there are just so many different uh, groups and, and there's so many conflicts uh, that are, are really orchestrated by the West and, and uh, you know, the globalist bankers and, and all of these various uh, groups that are going on. Uh, as you said, uh, CAR, Mali, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, all, you know, We didn't so even many. get to talk about genocide in Congo, which is one of the most, <laughs> yeah, one of yeah. the most heinous ongoing tragedies mm. in the world, I mean, by far. 
Oh uh, yeah, and I mean, and that is as uh, is just probably the least understood issue in all of Africa. You know, it's always we always talk about the Congo, the Congo, and you know, it, it's filled with child soldiers and rapists, and uh, people don't really understand how orchestrated the situation there is. Going back to the Rwandan genocide, and Paul Kagame, Museveni, all of these uh, despots who we've been installed, and and much of the fighting in. In uh, the, the uh, Congo is is completely uh, being uh, you know, orchestrated behind the scenes by the West. Absolutely, it's it's such a complicated subject. I mean, we would need easily a whole hour just on that, just to scratch the surface. Well, I mean, uh, well, hopefully we can have you back on very, you know, in the near future and and perhaps go into Congo because, it, as I said, it is. Uh, it is so important in terms of the exploitation and the money and generally just as this, uh, you know, the ultimate sort of failed state, which uh, you can you can create a small problem in Congo and that reverberates all throughout the country. Um, that's right. That's right. And I, I just want to make one point about the Congo. Mm. I, I just I'm, I'm physically incapable of not doing that. <laughs> um one of the principal things that people should take away from an analysis of, of Congo is what U.S. strategy is all throughout the world. And that is what they call crisis management. Okay, they, they are able to take any chaotic situation and then manage the outcome to their liking. Mm. So when you look at, when you want to uh, uh, analyze what's happening in Syria with the so-called peace process going on there, this is part of crisis management strategy. They want to create a crisis, foment a civil war, continue the chaos only so that they can then turn around and say, well, we can provide you a way out of that. The same is true in the Congo. If you look at what the uh, what the the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and the Obama administration, what they have done in the Congo, what policy has been, it is to continue to support and promote. Kagame and Museveni in, in Rwanda and Uganda, who then uh, from there directly fund M23 and the various other rebel groups and so forth for the purposes of continuing this genocide, continuing this civil war, so that they can A, enrich themselves, and B, manage the situation to an outcome of their liking. It is the most insidious strategy you could ever imagine, and this is what empire truly looks like. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Eric, as I said, um, we'll we'll, ha we'll have to have you back on, hopefully in the near future, to discuss uh, more about Africa and uh, just uh, geopolitically. Uh, you are just a, a fountain of knowledge. But uh, before we wrap up, please tell everybody about your website and your podcast, how people can support your work. Uh, I know you also have a new show with uh, Solomon Kamasong called The Antidote, which is excellent. I would encourage the listeners to go watch that as well. Yeah, um, thank you so much. So my website is stopimperialism.com or .org. It's, it's sort of, I own both domains. Um, you can find uh, pretty much all my work there. You can also find my work in, um, I, I do regular uh, contributions to RT in the op-edge section. I'm also a uh, regular contributor to Counterpunch, and uh, which is an excellent news source, mm. uh, especially for those of us in the United States who are also starved for news. Uh, and analysis. Um, I, you know, I, I contribute to a number of different places. Um, so you can, you can kind of pretty much find it all on my website. Um, my podcast is there as well. I'm kind of, I was originally doing it weekly. Now it's kind of bi-weekly or at least one or two a month. My, my schedule is a little bit more complicated these days. Uh, you mentioned uh, this new show that I'm doing. It's, you know, a show is sort of, <laughs> it's a collaborative project between uh, me and my, my, my friend Solomon Kamishong of Your World News. Uh, we just did the first episode a couple of weeks ago. We're going to be doing one uh, next week as well, talking all about uh, Ukraine and Venezuela, the similarities between mm. the two, uh, how similar they are, what regime change is all about, how all of this works. Um, and uh, let's see, what else is there? And, um, you know, find me on Facebook as well. I, I resisted Facebook for <laughs> literally a decade and only just recently got into, got, got into being active on Facebook. So anybody who wants to follow some of my updates and whatever, find me on there, on Twitter as well, at Stop Imperialism. Um, yeah, and pretty much my website. I think that that's kind of where you go. 
Absolutely, and I would really encourage everybody to to go and, and read your work. And um, you know, you, your podcasts are excellent, and they're they're very long, they're detailed. You go through so much uh, stuff, and I can see uh, how difficult it is to try and record that once a week. Um, well, Eric Dreitzer, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and I hope to talk to you very soon. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay, everybody. So that was my conversation with Eric Dreitzer of StopImperialism.com. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and if you do, then please visit PorkinsPolicyReview.wordpress.com. There you can find all the podcasts, you can download them, uh, you can see my writing, and if you do like the work that I'm doing, then please follow us through the RSS feed, through email updates, uh, you can always follow me on Twitter, at Porkins Policy, and you can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash 1138porkins. Uh, but if you do like what I'm doing, then the, the best thing that you can do is just spread the word. Uh, email the, the show to a friend, put it on your social media, uh, tell someone about it. Uh, it really helps a lot, and I appreciate all the work that the listeners do in, in promoting the show. So uh, with that, I will talk to you very soon. Hello.